Good morning, everybody. Hey, welcome uh, to people from Cokesbury Church and anybody who's joining us. I'm Paul Jones. I'm one of the worship uh, people here at Cokesbury. I'm so glad that you guys are joining us today. No matter where you are, if you're in your, in your, in your home, in your den, or maybe you're in a coffee shop or somewhere, man, feel free to worship along with us. You can stand up. You can raise your hands if you want. Don't spill your coffee. Uh, but we're excited to be here. It's Sunday morning, 10 a.m., and we are ready to worship. Let's go, Chris. Come on. Good morning, Cokesbury Church, and those watching online. We know that you guys are probably watching right now and singing along with us and clapping along with us. This next song is one of my favorite songs. It's called Raise a Hallelujah. It goes like this.
Father God, we come before you this morning, God. We just thank you just for your many blessings, God. I know that we all are surrounded and covered by your blood, God. We may be in different places on today and this morning, but we all come together as one. When we come to worship you, Father God, we just ask you that you be our protector, God, our provider, God. God, but you are always the healer, God. God, we love you and we trust you, God. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. And God, we just ask you just to, just cap around us and just be about us, Father. God, I just love you and we trust you, amen. Sing along with us. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare your eyes. Shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Sing along. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your
Welcome to Cokesbury this morning. Thanks so much for being a part of us and, and what we're doing here. Wanted to let you know that as a result of the precautions that we're going to need to take in our community, we're going to be moving to an online experience for Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. Recovery Cokesbury will also be on an online environment starting this Thursday, and we will do that again the following Thursday. I also want you to know that we will be continuing to do two of our groups online on Thursday nights. One group will be the men's chemical dependency group. The other group will be the women's chemical dependency group. They will both start as normally scheduled at 815 online. For more information about how you're going to join those groups online, go to recoverycokesbury.com. Thanks so much for being a part of Cokesbury Church and for um, walking this through with us as we work our way through, uh, you know, this new environment for a couple weeks. Hi, my name is Charles, and I'm one of the pastors here at Cokesbury. Thank you for joining us online today. While we may not physically be meeting together, our mission still continues in our community. So we encourage you to give online. You can give on our website, the Cokesbury app, or even click on the banner below. Thank you for your generosity. Your gifts will continue to change the lives of our city and our world. Also, this is a great opportunity for you to connect with us through email and through social media. Be sure to go to our website to sign up for our email updates. This is the best and fastest way to hear information. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, thank you, thank you for helping us continue to reach our community with the love and hope of Jesus.
tension. It's the stream between two realities, the pool between the way of life we are born into and the path to who we were created to be. It's the contrast between everyday experience and the places God breaks into your daily life. And that spot you find yourself in, your life intention, is exactly where God can create an outcome you never could have imagined. Well, it's good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us online. Um, my name is Stephen. I'm the senior pastor here. And if you're tuning in for the first time this week, we're really glad that you guys are here. That song that the band just sang um, really, I think, speaks at the heart of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, it's, it is an act of faith to make the decision as churches all across not only our country, but around the world have chosen not to meet. Um, it is not a sign of weakness. I think it is a sign of leadership that we are a part of the greater community and we're wanting to, to, uh, to lead and to set the tone and to be um, community players. And so we're advocating um, for not just the people of Cokesbury Church, but for everyone. Um, but I think that there's an underlying theme there that we all have to stay focused on, that we are people of faith and that fear does not have to dominate our life. It is possible to be responsible and to actually grow your faith. And so we've chosen um, to worship together for the next few weeks online, and we're glad that you guys are here. There are, believe it or not, a few people in the room. We've got a couple of staff members. Um, you know, our band is here. Uh, we've also got a tremendous team of volunteers who have left their families at home this morning who are here to make sure that things are going as they need to go. So I just want to say thanks, and I hope you're clapping wherever you're watching from. Uh, if you're not in your house and people are like, why are you clapping? You can just use this as an evangelism tool, right? And just say, hey, I'm, uh, I'm watching my church. You ought to stay six feet away and watch it with me too, right? <laughs> so um, I'm really, really glad that you guys are here. I um, want to just say to, to the people specifically of Cokesbury Church, I love you guys. And um, I know that three weeks ago, I don't know that any of us were really capturing the embrace of this new term on our society of social distancing. And I wanna make sure that you understand that as we go through these next few weeks together, um, social distancing is important, but we don't want that to turn into social isolation. And so um, part of the mission of the church, as you guys have heard me say for decades now, it's not what happens in any given room, it's who we are when we go back out into the world. And so I don't want you to take on a defeatist attitude. I want you to see this as an opportunity for God to work not only in your life, but in your neighborhood and in the lives of those around you. And so um, I want you to hear me say not only that I love you, but I'm excited about this because I think it's a great opportunity for us to be who we say we are. Now, we're going to try to go on as normal. We're going to continue in our series. Um, ironically, this whole idea of doing a series on tension, I think every single week that passes by, it's an important thing because all of us experience tension in our daily lives. And some of us are experiencing a lot more tension today than we were even three weeks ago. It's that um, idea of the unknown or not really sure what tomorrow is going to bring. And in reality, it's just an intensif intensification of what we deal with every single day because none of us are promised tomorrow. Um, the best predictions on the planet really can't guarantee what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. We only can live in the day that we've been given. And so that's basically what this series has been about. It's an intensive look about the intent, the, the tension that a lot of us feel between where we want our lives to go, juxtaposed up against where our lives are right now. And it's um, an examination of our faith and, and what we profess with our lips. And does that really match up with how we're living our lives? And so today, we're going to continue on that. We're in the first five chapters of the book of Romans. We're going to be in just 16 verses of Romans chapter 2. So if you've got a mobile device or bless you, if you've got a Bible, you can go ahead and turn Romans chapter 2. We're going to be in the first 16 verses. So that ought to give some of y'all a little bit of room to relax. Um, this is not going to be a five-hour church service. It's 16 verses. It's going to be great. I was thinking uh, this week, um, you know, especially as different sporting um, groups and leagues were trying to figure out how do they navigate this new reality that we're living in at the moment, 
Um, it got me thinking about that when, when we're competing, right? If you're in a competition, it's really important to understand how is the score actually being kept? Like, what is it that actually makes you the winner of the game? Um, because there's nothing worse than not knowing what's going to get you exactly where you want to be. And if you think about it, like if you're watching baseball, right? It's just been postponed. It's not over yet. But if you're watching baseball, the team that wins is going to be the team that actually scores the most runs, right? It's very, very simple. Things like errors or hits or um, pitch counts for various pitchers, those stats are interesting if you're really into that kind of thing. But the only thing that ultimately matters is the final score. It's the same thing when you watch a football game. Uh, the team that wins the game is the team that scores the most points. It doesn't matter how many yards of offense you have. Um, it doesn't matter the number of sacks that the defense is able to record. It really doesn't matter how many penalties you have. Those are great stats, but they're not actually germane to winning the game. Or think about something that's being discussed a lot in our day. Um, if you want to become the president of the United States, it does not matter how much popular vote is. It actually matters. Can you win the electoral college? You always want to know that this is the standard. And if I accomplish these things, then ultimately I'm going to win. It's like when you're working, right? Most of us don't want to go, th go through an employee review without knowing what it's what is the standard that we're being held to? We want to know what are the benchmarks, right? What are the identifiers? What are the goals that I need to be working on so that when I go through that review, I've got a greater sense that these are the things that I'm being held accountable for. For those of us that are students, same thing applies, right? When you're in school and you're facing a test, you really want to know what is the standard that I'm being held to. When I was in seminary, um, I took an Old Testament class, and it was uh, actually two semesters, one of the only classes that you spend an entire year. And if you've ever read the scripture, you know that um, when you work your way through the Old Testament, at moments it can be very dry, at moments it can be incredibly confusing. Um, there's lots of lists and rules and all kinds of things, and it's a lot of information. And so there was only one test, and it was the final exam. And it was a four-hour exam. There were 500 questions encompassing the entire Old Testament. And so we took the exam. When it was over, the professor brought us all back into the room. And so there were a couple of hundred of us in this room. And so we're sitting there, and he starts handing out the tests. And you can see this wave kind of sweep over the room as people started looking at their test scores. The highest test score in the entire class was a 41, and people were losing their minds because here in our part of the world, we're held to a standard, right? Generally speaking, 90 and above is an A, and then you work your way down. And so we were sitting there thinking, well, everybody's failed the Old Testament test. People were literally slamming their books shut, throwing their stuff in their backpack, and marching out of the room, and the professor's just standing there. No reaction whatsoever, even as people were yelling at him. Finally, once there was a natural pause, he just said, I just want those of you who've remained to understand that if you scored above a 40, you got an A. And if you scored above a 25, you got a B. I had scored a 21, so I made a C, right? But the wave of um, just pumping the brakes and catching my breath and realizing I didn't fail was staggering. And the lesson he wanted to teach us was that we're going to be students of Scripture our whole life, that you can never know everything about what God's word has to teach us. It's something that you have to build into your life every single day. And as years go by, we get a greater understanding of who God is and who God's created us to be. But it was that standard, right? It would have been great to know that up front, to not go a couple of weeks freaking out, thinking that I was gonna be the one that failed out of seminary. You don't wanna be a, a preacher that's failed out of seminary. That's not a very good look. But we wanna know what is that standard, there's nothing more disconcerting than not knowing. And I think that's true in virtually every aspect of our life. For those of us that are married, you understand this. It is huge, right? Knowing the expectation or understanding what the standard is in your relationship is absolutely massive when it comes to navigating through that relationship. Um, I learned very early on, it's one of the cool things about Church Online, 
My wife is at home watching, so she cannot add an opinion into this story. But I learned very early on when Beth and I got married, it happened, in fact, the first few months that we were <clears throat> officially married. Beth walks into the room and she's got this huge smile on her face. And she's like, well, honey, what do you think about this outfit? I promise you, this really happened. Does it make me look fat? Now, every man that's ever been married or in a committed relationship, you understand that that's like the worst question that you can possibly be asked um, because you don't know how you're supposed to answer that question. Nobody pulls you aside. There's not like an extra little class on, on how you deal as a spouse in those types of situations. And so I just remember cold staring at her, like expressionless. And she was cold staring back at me. And in my mind, I'm thinking of all of these different defensive maneuvers that might need to happen if I don't navigate this right. And so for this really awkward long pause, we're just cold staring back and forth at each other. Um, I knew that my mama didn't raise no fools. And so I was not going to answer that question. And finally, she just busted out laughing. And she's like, Stephen, listen, um, my family has always been super honest about stuff. So you can be super honest with me. And for those of you that are regularly connected to our church, you have probably met Beth's mother. She is brutally honest. <clears throat> but um, I still wasn't gonna answer the question. And so I just said, well, I think it looks great. And she was like, you are absolutely lying. And she just kind of marched out of the room. But here's the point. What I've learned over the last um, soon to be 26 years of being married to this um, incredible human being is that she wants the truth in every conversation. Obviously, you have to couch that and be careful not to cause damage. But ultimately, when she's asking for an opinion, she really does want an opinion. So there is a standard there, right? Does that make sense? I, su I succeed in marriage when I give an honest and straight answer. And there are other areas of our relationship, and I'm sure it's true for you too, where I actually have to ask the question because I am a man. Do you want me to listen and tell you you're amazing? Or do you want me um, to actually give you an opinion and try to like take out my tool belt, right? And fix it. <clears throat> but again, the point is, <clears throat> I know what the standard is. And just as an aside, I think that's probably a really great question for relationships, isn't it? Like if you think about the relationships you're in, just having enough honesty to say, hey, in this particular moment, what is it that you actually need from me? It sets the table in a way that you can actually not talk at each other and certainly not talk past each other, but you can actually have an intimate moment of true, honest connection. It's a great question to ask. What is it that you actually need from me? I think in every area of our life, we really do need to ask ourselves, what is the standard that I'm being held to? And what are the steps I need to make that will allow me to live up to that standard? And I bring all of this up because even though we seldom talk about it inside the church, God has a standard for every single human being. And it's important for us to understand, well, what is that standard? What are our lives being measured against, really? So that we can see who we are and how we fit into the big picture of what God's trying to do. And yet, you and I live in a culture where everybody wants what they want out of life. It's like everybody has a choose-your-own-adventure kind of mentality. And one of the things I love about the Scriptures is that the Bible is very clear about what God wants from us. And so when you start talking about this standard that God has for humanity, I know people get a little bit nervous. This may be a great topic for those of us that are watching online because we may be able to be a little bit more honest with ourselves today than we would have been had this room been packed out with people. And we're gonna see the anxiety that this creates in today's lesson. We're gonna be in Romans chapter two. If you were with us last week, we dug into Romans chapter one, where we learned that one of the principal ways to deal with the tension that you and I are feeling in our everyday life is we've got to see our identity primarily as being in Jesus, right? 
It's not so much about what we do for a living. It's not so much about where we live or the amount of stuff that we can accumulate because all of those things come and go in life. But what matters most is that we see ourselves, those of us that are following Jesus, that our primary sense of identity is being in Jesus. And we also learn that when our identity is found only in Jesus, it begins to free us up from being tossed around by our circumstances or our failures or the moments where we make mistakes in life. Those things still happen, but they don't have the same dominating voice speaking into our lives. And because of our identity, Paul told us in Romans chapter one that there ought to be, um, as he put it, this sense of obligation for those of us that are following Jesus to wanna just naturally reach out and help other people. It's not just a personal thing. There's a community aspect to this. That once I've experienced the finished work of Jesus in my life, then I've gotta start looking around and figuring out how can I help somebody else? Now tell me there's a greater lesson that you and I could learn than in this moment right now. Our need not to shut down, our need not to lose focus, not to so isolate ourselves that we forget that there's a whole world out there who's struggling too. But then you get to the second half of chapter one. And Paul talks about a potential stumbling block. And you can read this for yourself this afternoon, but basically in the second half of chapter one, what Paul teaches us is that the world really is broken. That people were suppressing, as he says, the truth of the gospel, the fact that Jesus is the ultimate antidote for an ailing world. And because of that blanket rejection of truth, the world has become damaged. There are moments of beauty, moments of grace, moments of um, unbelievable sense of community, but by and large, there's distance there. And it's in the context of that that we move into chapter two. <clears throat> and it would be really easy for many of us to look at the brokenness of the world and to say, you know, that right there, that's exactly why I hate the world. That's why exactly I hate a certain group of people. And you end up creating this us versus them kind of mentality. And it's in Romans chapter two, the first 16 verses, that Paul grabs that mindset by the horns and begins to wrestle it to the ground. Because God has a standard by which he's judging every single human being. And in the first 16 verses of this chapter, we see three aspects of God's standard that are critical for those of us that want to get life right. And I believe if we can capture these three aspects and not just understand them, but build them into our daily life, y'all listen, I promise, it's gonna cause us to walk closer with Jesus than we've ever walked before. It's gonna bring us a deeper sense of meaning and it's gonna bring more joy and more peace and it is gonna cause this elusive thing called hope to continue to well up inside of our souls. And I think it will further clarify what we're supposed to be about as a community of faith. So here we go, Romans chapter two, verse one. This is Paul speaking again to the people in Rome. He says, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you joy, joy, uh, judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you not think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Now notice what's going on here. I know that's, that's a thick few verses right there. Paul is saying that in light, uh, in light of the brokenness of our world, maybe the common response for people of faith is to naturally want to judge other people. It's an incredibly common thing. If you were to go out into any community in America, 
and you were to ask someone, when you hear the word quit Christian, what's the first word that com comes to mind? More times than not, the first word you're gonna hear is the word judgmental. And that's really unfortunate. Sometimes I think that Jesus could use better PR than that because that's not the way it's supposed to be. So Paul says it's inexcusable when you go and you judge somebody else. Now, why is it inexcusable? Well, we see in verse two, Paul tells us that God judges by truth, so we should actually choose kindness. Look at what it says. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. And I use the word kindness because it appears over and over and over again in these verses. And so because God judges by truth, you and I need to choose kindness. Now, here's the thing. Remember when I said that everybody lives sort of a choose your own adventure kind of life? We live in a culture that is teaching us that you can choose your own truth. But here's the deal. If your truth is different from my truth, then neither one is necessarily the truth. We can't have situational truth. There can't be flexible truth. There can't be truth on a sliding scale. Truth is, exists at all times. It does not change. It never wavers, right? Like you and I, we can choose our clothes. We can choose our coffee. We can choose here in the South how many crystal hamburgers we're gonna eat on any given day. We can choose in a few months who we're gonna vote for. And we can choose who we would have pulled for in March Madness, but you cannot choose truth. Truth is something that sits apart from us no matter how we feel about it. And I know this might be offensive to some of us, but if you don't believe me when I say that truth is not flexible, all you gotta do is look at the world in which you and I live right now. We think it's, it's my truth or it's your truth. And right now, everyone's truth is conflicting with one another. That's why we're so divided and hostile toward those who don't believe what we believe. You and I may not like the truth, but it's still the truth. And when we say, well, this is my truth, what we're really saying is, this is what I want. <laughs> and listen, it's not the truth if it dishonors God and it hurts other people. That's just the way that we're choosing to live. Paul says, God judges by truth. And because God judges by truth, none of us should sit in judgment of another human being. Listen to this, verse three. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his goodness? There's that word goodness. Forbearance and patience. Not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. See, here's the thing. The church for far too long has held a PhD in passing judgment on other people. But right here, Right here in the scriptures, it says that when you judge other people, you condemn yourself. Is that not the same thing Jesus said, Matthew chapter seven? He says, do not judge. Now that word judge literally means judging to condemnation. So it's not saying you can't disagree and it's not saying you can't call something wrong. The problem is when you condemn somebody, because if you've ever felt condemnation, you know that that robs you of your dignity. You know that that begins to dehumanize you. And when you condemn somebody, you begin to deny them the possibility of even experiencing redemption in their life. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. See, Jesus is pointing at a problem right here. 
that whatever standard we set for other people that we judge other people against, we're all falling short. (laughs) Because the things we hate about other people are often the things that we always do. Or as I like to say, my sin looks really terrible when you do it, right? Here's what I know. Think about the things that really bug you. I guarantee you, It's something that you used to struggle with or that you're struggling with right now. Like if you're in a conversation and you're like, well, so-and-so is always talking. I guarantee you, if you ask your spouse, they will tell you that you are a super chatty Kathy and your real problem is you don't like the competition for the talking space. If you're like, well, so-and-so, they are so hypocritical. I guarantee you that there is hypocrisy that you wrestle with in your own personal life. You just don't like seeing it reflected back to you. I think the most condemnatory people are people who've struggled with something in the past and maybe they're not struggling with it right now and they're looking down on people who struggle the way they used to struggle. See, what Paul is saying is, rather than being judgmental, Like before we pull the trigger on condemnation, remember that we're not living up to the standard either. And we've got to understand that at the root of most of the judgment that we pass on each other, it's idolatry. Because here's what I know for sure. I may not know a lot, but I know this for sure. God has not asked any of us to be the judge of anybody. He hasn't asked us to sit on the Supreme Court of he needs help judging the human race. Billy Graham put it this way, it's God's job to judge, it's the Spirit's job to convict, and it's my job to love. See, Paul is not just looking down on a group of Christians. Paul is trying to speak life. Paul is showing us a way toward freedom. He's saying, put down the gavel and focus on loving people. It's the exact same thing that we learned last week. Jesus made it so simple. If you wanna get your life right, love God, love people. Get yourself off the fourth circuit court of the world focused on me. Nobody has ever been condemned or shamed into a relationship with Jesus. He says it, Paul says at the end of verse four, that God's kindness, God judges by truth, but God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. In other words, it's not condemnation. It's things like grace, and it's things like compassion, and it's things like patience. It's things like maintaining your sense of hope in the midst of a crisis. That's what opens up people's heart to Jesus. Paul says, choose kindness. Love doesn't mean that we champion everything that everybody stands for. Love means we disagree, but we love them anyway. Let's move on, verse five. Paul continues, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, God will repay each person according to what they've done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. So Paul is telling us God judges by the truth, so you and I should show kindness. And now he's saying that God judges impartially. So we should work what is good. In other words, the cross is the great leveling field. There are no special sins in the world. God judges every single one of us by the same standard. The word impartial literally means total fairness. 
And the reason that judgment puts us in a problem is because it gets our focus off the mission. We spend our time trying to make a point. There are lots of people in our planet right now who want to make a point. And when you're always trying to make a point, you seldom are going to make a difference. And if ever our world needed people who could make a difference, it's right now. Even this debate going on within churches, should you still, as some great act of faith, pack your churches? Or should you cancel and give people breathing space? The back and forth is ridiculous. It's killing our witness. Our whole purpose is to understand that everybody's trying to live out their faith. And that expression does not deserve judgment. What it actually deserves is a pat on the back that at least the church is willing to respond. See, once we understand that our sin, that our shortcomings, that our mistakes and our failures, while they may be different than someone else's, in God's eyes, they carry the exact same weight. That levels the playing field and it frees us up to actually building relationships rather than building up walls. And that's why grace is so powerful. Because I cannot earn my way into God's favor. I can only accept God's grace. I can't beg for it. I can't borrow it. And I cannot steal it from anyone else. My sins have to be nailed to the cross just like everybody else's. So Paul says, understanding that means that you can approach your life focused on goodness that gives us the ability to actually go make a difference in this world, to be a part of what God's trying to do, which is bring redemption, not to change people's behavior, but to do heart surgery on the inside, to give them a new perspective and a new outlook on who they've been created to be, because make no mistake about it, even though fear is running rampant around the world right now, and all of us have been shown just how small this planet is, hope is still alive. And if those of us that claim the name of Jesus will be smart and be responsible and share love and step off the judgment throne for five seconds, we can actually show the world that this is how you get through this situation. You don't buy into the panic You don't shudder yourself in and isolate yourself to the point that you begin to lose hope. No, in the face of a crisis, you keep looking toward Jesus and you keep believing that tomorrow is going to get better than today. Now, we got to wrap this thing up. Verse 12. Paul says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they don't have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. So Paul wraps up these 16 verses with I think the most important piece of God's standard. And that is that God judges by Jesus. Not what you've done, not where you've been, not how distant you may feel, not by your sins, not by your addiction, not by the words that you've spoken to somebody that you can't get back, not by the circumstance that maybe you didn't handle the way you thought it would. No, Paul's saying you got to understand that God judges by Jesus. See, Jesus has done the work That's the reason that God took on flesh. 
lived among us, allowed Jesus to take the sins of the world on his shoulders. That's why Jesus died on the cross, was placed in a tomb, and three days later did the ultimate miracle of stepping from death back to life again. It is not about us, it's about Jesus. And so when God judges the human race, the ultimate question is, what did you do with Jesus? God judges by Jesus. So listen to this, be doers of good. Paul's giving us a roadmap to freedom, y'all. It's not enough to simply know what to do with your life. We say it all the time, that knowledge by itself never leads to transformation. Real change happens when you and I figure out how to link our knowledge with application, that's when life change actually begins to make a difference. And y'all, I don't wanna be a community of faith that talks a good talk, but there's no fruit on the tree. And one of the things I love about Cokesbury Church is that if you've got a pulse, you see fruit hanging on trees everywhere. You see it when people's primary concern is not that we're canceling church and going only online, but hey, when they email us and they ask, well, what are we doing about Manor House and how are we handling all of the relationships that this church is in where we're helping people who are struggling right now? Or, or hey, what can you give me to do because I feel like our son or daughter's school is gonna close down and we wanna be sure we're engaged. You can see it in how people give. You can see it in how quick people wanna serve. You can see it if you were here right now in this room. Just the number of staff and volunteers that, that made their way out on a Sunday morning for one hour of live worship. Y'all, that's what matters most. So while this is a moment of social distance and a moment where we pump the brakes and think about what changes do we need to take to protect our community, see it as a moment of joy, a moment where you can play your part where you can trust God, where you can step into the life of a neighbor who maybe is starting to feel isolated. Where maybe two weeks from now, God may call you to be a part of some movement that's making sure that people who don't have a home are taken care of or people that don't have food on their table can find food. I, I don't know what these next few weeks are gonna bring, but I promise you in the midst of all the bad news, we're gonna see God move and it's gonna be powerful. And whenever we're able to get back together again, there's gonna be a reason to celebrate because y'all, Paul makes it clear, God is good. Let's pray together. Gracious God, I give you thanks for this day and I thank you that we live in a reality where science and faith don't have to contradict each other. I thank you for giving people intelligence and passion and skill and gifts. I thank you specifically for this church, God, and for the ability to be able to play just such a minor role. And God, I pray for every human being that even in the midst of uncertainty and fear that you will give them grace, that you'll show your mercy, that hope will be real. God, be with us as we go throughout this week. Open the right doors, show us the right path, give us the right way to connect. It's in your name that we pray, amen.
Hey, thanks for tuning in with us this morning. We're so glad that you're watching. We're glad that you're a part of the church, being a part of the body of being people that have had their lives changed by the love of God and going out into the world. Uh, we get a chance this week to, to be a thermostat and not a thermometer. And I think that's a huge thing for us. Find some ways to love people this week. Find some ways to just serve. Find ways to check on neighbors, support a local business. Maybe just buy one roll of toilet paper instead of 70, uh, something like that. But find some ways just to go out and love people because that's what we do at Cokesbury. We try to love people to Jesus. So you go do that this week. Thanks.